I want to join everybody else and thank the organizers for all the hard work that I have invested in organizing this uh, great meeting and also for the invitation to report on results that have appeared in the context of ADSCMT over the recent years. So ADSCMT and more generally applied holography is maturing as a topic and it's certainly good to have excellent uh, introductory books on the subject and two such books appeared um, over the last couple or three years in the literature and this is certainly a good thing for the new beginners and I also to point out at a review that appeared late last year and it's basically summarizing everything that has happened over the last 10 years of ADSCMT. So the main foci of ADSCMT is the study of transport properties of holographic matter the phase diagrams of holographic matter at finite chemical potential and magnetic field, as well as non-trivial quenches, which are non-trivial, non-perturbative probes of holographic matter. Now, what I chose to discuss in my presentation today is linear response. But I hope that it will become clear that um, linear response, the conclusions that we draw about linear response, is intimately related to the possible ground states that you can find in holography, and this is really coming from the second, the second topic, the phase diagrams and the back reactive geometries against black hole instabilities. Now, what I want to discuss is strange metals, and strange metals are of fundamental importance because they realize strongly coupled phases of matter from which long-lived excitations or quasi-particle excitations are completely absent. And the only long-lived excitations that, are allowed, that you are allowed to have in the system are precisely the ones that are either protected by conservation laws or from, by symmetry breaking. Now, holography is a very good framework to really discuss physics without quasi-particles, and we really hope that it will become a use, very useful resource to draw information, uh, non-trivial information about such theories. So, the nice thing about holography is that you can take several limits of it. You can take a limit and make contact with hydrodynamics, or you can take a limit and you can make contact with what is called in condensed matter the memory matrix formalism. And these are the only tools that you have at your disposal when all the information that you have is some conservation laws and you are at strong coupling. So you really need to have a very good understanding of your system and use these conservation, lo conservation laws to say something non-trivial about your system. At the same time, there is an underlying microscopic theory in holography, which you can use to really probe questions that you can not really answer in hydrodynamics or the memory matrix formalism. And the way we realize this in holography is through uh, finding novel ground states, which you can very easily study, and holography is a very, very powerful tool in this aspect. Now, what I want to discuss today is transport. And transport experiments probe collective degrees of freedom, which are responsible for the transport of heat and charge in the system. And the way that this is done in the lab is by introducing external uh, electric fields and temperature gradients, and you measure the response current as a function of the frequency of these uh, external fields, the temperature, the chemical potential, and other external parameters. Now, the final goal is to really understand general features of the underlying microscopic theory, which explain, really, the transport properties of your materials, of big classes of materials. Now, a little bit of bureaucracy before I go on. We need some definitions. So the ultimate goal of the experimentalist is to, ext to extract what is called the uh, matrix of transport coefficients. Right? So this is uh, the matrix that is sitting in the middle. And what it does is it relates the sources to the currents. And it's not very hard to imagine that this matrix contains non-trivial information about the two-point functions of the currents, of the retarded, uh, of the two-point, of the retarded Green's functions of the currents of the system. Now, sigma, that I have written here, is the electric conductivity. It basically reflects Ohm's law. Kappa bar is the thermal conductivity at zero electric field. It reflects Fourier's law. And also there is the off-diagonal terms, uh, alpha bar and alpha, which are there to remind me that if I have finite uh, charge density in the system, there will be the thermoelectric effect. 
an electric field will also source a heat current, and the temperature gradient will also source an electric field. Now, a very useful quantity that I want to define is what is called the open circuit thermal conductivity. And this is the conductivity that you very easily measure in the lab by simply removing the cables. Right? So what happens in the bulk of the material is that you have an opposing uh, electric field uh, to the external temperature gradient, which is keeping the current from flowing. Okay, so this is going to be a very, very important um, quantity for my, for my talk. And also you will often see DC or DC limit on my slides, and this simply reflects, um, corresponds to the omega goes to zero limit for the sources. Um, okay. So let me remind you um, what is summarizing the basic properties of the good metals, not the strange metals, so that we can appreciate the new physics that we discover by looking at strange metals. So the, the hallmark of, of the Fermi liquid is long-lived quasi-particle excitations, which carry heat, equally good as they carry charge, and this immediately puts a constraint on transport, right? So it is the same degrees of freedom that carry charge and heat, and this immediately tells you that uh, the thermal conductivity and the electric conductivity are locked on to each other. And for this very simple reason, there is a there is a law which is verified experimentally in condensed matter physics at low temperatures, which is called the wiedemann franz law. So if I take the ratio of kappa over sigma t, I'm finding a temperature-independent number. These two numbers are intimately related precisely because the quasi-particles carry both heat and charge. Now, the momentum relaxing mechanism for a Fermi liquid is the coupling of a lattice with the fermions. And this gives a very robust scaling of the DC electric conductivity at low temperatures, which scales like T to the minus 2. And the fact that all the momentum relaxation is happening from a lattice, it is telling you that the mean free path of your quasi-particles has to be longer than the lattice distance. Right? So if you do a measurement and you extract a mean free path which is much smaller than that, it means that something else is happening with your system. There is a strong coupling going on. And strains or bad metals, you can define them as materials which violate any or all of these properties. Okay, uh, strange metals are very often found at, in the vicinity of a quantum uh, critical point. And of quite often, quantum critical points in condensed matter are described by relativistic conformal field theories. Now, let me imagine that I have this... Uh, blob of matter, this soup of matter, which is at finite temperature and it is at zero chemical potential. What happens when you measure the electric conductivity of uh, such, such a material, you find a finite number. And this finite number has to do with microscopic processes which have nothing to do with the transport of net charge. These are really dynamic, dynamics which is going on within the microscopic degrees of freedom. And this is really new physics. Already this is telling you that you are going to violate the wiedemann franz law. And there is also some recent experiments which uh, involve clean samples of graphene, and they are, they are testing much more, of course, but they are certainly testing this set of ideas. Okay, now let's become a bit more ambitious, and let's bring the system in a finite chemical potential. And let's examine the transport coefficients. So what you see there is the appearance of a delta function, which comes really from conservation of momentum. I have not introduced a momentum relaxing mechanism yet, and much of these uh, transport coefficients is fixed by word identities for two-point functions. The only coefficient which is not fixed by uh, the word identities is what, I called, is what I call sigma q here. And to extract sigma q, you really have to do a microscopic calculation. It's not something that you can fix by looking at symmetries or conservation laws. Now, there is, of course, this dominating universal uh, term, which is the delta function, which comes from conservation of momentum. But there is really interesting physics going on in this sigma q. 
And the way to extract sigma q is by considering the right degrees of freedom or the right currents. Now, if you just plug in um, these uh, transport coefficients in the formula I wrote down before, you will see that the delta function really drops out. And what is responsible for this dropping out of the delta function is this electric field that is generated by your material. So these are definitely quantities um, that will isolate uh, this uh, incoherent or quantum critical current, and they are certainly interesting uh, quantities to study. Now, let's become a bit more realistic. And the way that you can introduce momentum relaxation in your system in the context of QFT or CFT is by coupling your theory to sources which actually break translations. And in this way, you will relax momentum and you will get finite answers in the omega goes to zero limit. Now, there is certainly some universal sources that you can think of, and this is coupling your theory to the stress tensor, which is like putting your theory on a, on a curved manifold. Or you can introduce a spatially varying uh, charge density. And this is done through the introduction of spatially varying chemical potential. Now, for my talk, I am going to use uh, sources which satisfy periodic boundary conditions. And this is really putting, um, giving you a lot of uh, control on what is happening in, in your system. So what is going to happen after you introduce a memory relaxing, uh, uh, momentum relaxing mechanism? So if you think of perturbative lattice deformations, very, very tiny, small deformations, then this pole that appears in the transport coefficients is going to be resolved to a simple pole. Right? So the delta function will be resolved to a simple pole. And this is essentially the physics that Trude described 100 years ago. Now, Tau, what I call tau here, is the momentum uh, relaxation rate or momentum relaxation time. And as you can imagine, it is going to be a function of the lattice sources that I introduced into the system. It is going to be a function of temperature, and it is also going to be a function of the chemical potential. Now, when tau to the minus 1 is small, and the delta functions get resolved by this simple pole, and if I just go back to the coefficients I wrote down and I just replace it, then if I take the omega goes to zero limit, then you will see that everything is dominated by this tau, by the momentum relaxation time. And this is go going to give me very, very strong constraints for systems in which momentum relaxes very, very uh, slowly. Now, tau is a function of temperature, and as I'm lowering the temperature of the system, there are several things that can happen. So this pole can just go back to the origin of of the axis and translations will be restored and momentum will stop relaxing. Or it can go down and it can join the other more microscopic time scales of the system and this is when I will have incoherent transport. Okay, so this will be new phases of matter in which um, the time, the momentum relaxation time, you cannot even define it, right? So that there is no privileged pole in your system. And these are really new ground states. So is there any hope for universality in all this? So there is two ways that you can hope that something universal can come out from uh, study in any theoretical framework. The first is if you relax uh, momentum very weakly, you can study the incoherent currents, right? So you can, for example, study kappa or the DC limit of kappa at finite density. And this is really singling out precisely this incoherent piece. Or you can break translations uh, in a very bad way, and you can really look at uh, new phases of matter in which translations are, or momentum relaxation is completely absent, even at zero temperature. Now, for weak uh, momentum relaxation, you, and because of this large tau which dominates everything, you can write down some e effective Wiedemann Franz law, which is what replaces the Fermi liquid. Uh, Wiedemann Franz law. So, what you can actually show is that the ratio of kappa bar with sigma t in this case has to be equal to the ratio of the entropy density divided by the charge density. And at the same time, you can show that the whole angle 
is uh, proportional to uh, the DC limit of the electric conductivity. Now, the whole angle is the angle that is formed between the electric current and an external electric field after you introduce a perpendicular magnetic field. So the current is deflected, you measure this, uh, this angle, and it is certainly one of the observables you are going to be interested in. So, again, we do discover some universal relations in the case of weak momentum relaxation, but um, you might also uh, want to discuss the other piece, the, the incoherent piece which has to do with the microscopics of your theory. Okay, so how can we do this in, in the framework of holography? Now, the, I am imagining that I have a thermal phase, which holographically is described by a black brain type of solution, which has a killing horizon and a radial direction. Now, at infinity, I have to impose some boundary conditions, which really give me the sources of, of the operators I am I'm imagining that I'm using to use as lattice operators. And the, the, whole, the, the big task is to now um, find such solutions um, and after you find such solutions, you also want to now test its transport properties. You introduce electric fields and temperance of gradients on the boundary of, of ADS and you read off the response currents basically by just looking at the fall off of your bulk fields. Right? And in this way you can really extract the transport coefficients from holography. Now, the first examples that um, we looked at, they, they, they showed that this is a very hard numerical problem in general relativity. And um, there is quite a few groups that looked at this. Um, but in all those examples, momentum at low temperatures were, was really relaxing in a very uh, slow way. So we were going back to the translationally invariant ground states. And I don't want to say that this is boring at all. Um, there is these incoherent currents which are hiding there somewhere, but, and you have to just dig in there and extract them. And there is some very interesting physics that is going on. So, if I want to understand how incoherent ground states now are going to show up, I can think of it in a very RG way. And this is, and holography is excellent is in giving me pictures on how to achieve that. So for the, for the ground states where, where translations are basically restored, what, what I'm doing is that I'm looking at the low temperature limit of my black holes and I'm examining what is happening with a cold horizon. Now, without any lattices or without any uh, translation breaking, the ground states modulo symmetry breaking, which I'm not discussing today, have been classified at finite chemical potential and they are uh, given by ADS2, some extremal horizon uh, geometries, or uh, geometries in which you recover some lifted symmetry or hyperscaling, hyperscale violating behavior. Now, if you think of deforming such an RG flow by a, a lattice operator, it basically means that the lattice operator from the infrared point of view is irrelevant. Okay, so, and as you lower the temperature, again, physics is going to be dominated by the same ground states. But what can actually happen when you have strong lattices is that you can completely change the RG flow. You can find new horizon geometries which break translations, and these are the, the candidates, or the proposal, is that these geometries are the, the geometries which realize incoherent transport. So, much of my talk is going to be based on the DC limit of uh, conductivities or transport. And since we are going to deal with, um, with some very, very non-trivial geometries, basically the only symmetry that I'm keeping from these geometries is just the time translations. Right? So I think it is, it is a very good idea to understand DC transport in these geometries. So let's imagine that we have a general framework we, in which we can introduce uh, external fields and it gives us some, it gives us back these current densities. When I take the DC limit, it is like uh, introducing constant electric fields and constant temperature gradients, right? So these are time independent sources. And then if I have finite DC conductivity, 
what I'm expecting is that those currents are going to form a static configuration or a steady state configuration. Now, what is of interest in transport is not what these little currents are doing um, inside the period. What I really want to study is how charge and heat is hopping from one period to the other. Right? So then it makes sense that what you want to do is to really find the fluxes of these currents across these periods. And as soon as you manage to find these fluxes, um, which you can just integrate, then you can extract the transport coefficients by writing uh, the currents as linear combinations of your sources. And this is exactly the information you, you want to extract from your theory. Now, let's imagine of doing this in holography now. I have these constant electric fields on the boundary which are not oscillating, and the task is really to find a stationary geometry. Right? So I'm taking, uh, for simplicity, I'm assuming a static geometry for the background, and I'm introducing external fields which will give me a stationary black hole in, in a perturbative expansion. Okay, so the leading term is going to hide all, all the transport coefficients, and if I start making my source, of course, uh, now nonlinear, the, the black hole will back react and every, all the time dependence will, will come and hit me. But within the regime of linear response, all I want to construct is a stationary black hole which preserves the, the time-like killing vector that I had before. Now, the existence of this time-like killing vector allows me to really do something pretty non-trivial. The combination of the killing vector and the gate symmetry that I have in the bulk allows me to really relate the fluxes and only the fluxes of the currents on the boundary to fluxes of currents which, are the, which I can define on the horizon. And if you really think about it, this is, this is basically coming up with a version of SMAR formula or, Comar, uh, or COMARS uh, techniques, but now to discuss the currents and the transport properties of black holes. And this certainly extends some earlier hints um, that showed up in holography where um, the background geometries that were being examined were very symmetric and these currents are just constant. Okay, so what we understand now is that um, what is preserved as you move from the horizon to the boundary is really the fluxes, which is exactly what you are interested in. What I have told you up to now is nothing. Right? So if I'm strong enough and I can find this perturbation, then I can just read off the currents either from the boundary or from the horizon. I still need to solve this, this perturbation. Now, one can, one can get some nicer results if you, if you keep pushing this set of ideas. And so these currents on the horizon, I can construct them from my Lagrangian, right? So I, they are expressed in terms of the metric, of the gauge fields, and all the um, matter content of my theory. Now, if I examine uh, an expansion of, of these fields very, very close to the horizon, then in an expansion close to the horizon, I am forced to introduce some functions which are defined on the horizon. And let me single out uh, two scalar functions, W and P, and also a vector that comes out from this expansion. Now, if I plug in this expansion in the expressions that I have for the currents, what I can see is that the horizon currents are expressed in terms of these scalar functions and the vector. And I am using here Einstein-Maxwell as, as an example to, to show you how this, this roughly works. Okay, so someone needs to give me these functions W, V, and P. P does not appear directly in the currents, but it will be part of the story. Now the next thing I want to do is to really impose constraints the constraints of gravity. So if I do that on a surface very, very close to the horizon, then I, what I am discovering is a closed set of equations which have a unique solution and they, unique, and, uh, and they, and they uniquely fix the currents on the horizon. Right? So, and if you, if you want to, to think about it, this is uh, an exact utilization of the old membrane paradigm in holography. Now, I have to tell you that this is not a derivative expansion, okay? I'm not assuming anything about the derivative gradients on the horizon. All I'm saying is that this is an exact statement, okay? The, the only 
thing that I took to zero or to a long wavelength is the time dependence. So I took a very, very small, uh, slow time dependence of the system, and what I discovered is a closed set of equations, of equations on the horizon, which you can actually think as a very rough uh, Stokes flow on the curved black hole horizon. Now, I used Einstein-Maxwell as, as an example, and you might think that if I start making things more general, then this is going to go uh, seriously wrong. Um, but you can actually introduce more general fields. For example, you can introduce scalars, and all that is going to change is a new ingredient in the Stokes law equations, which looks like a friction term from the fluid uh, point of view. You can also break time reversal. I use the static background uh, to, um, to really discuss this. And you can also break time reversal by introducing magnetic fields. And if you have inhomogeneity, the combination of magnetic fields with inhomogeneity on the background is going to produce some exotic magnetization currents. So now the background itself is going to have little circulating currents inside those periods, and they are certainly going to affect um, the, the Stokes flow equations on the horizon by the introduction of the analogs of the Lorentz force and the Coriolis force. So this is one ingredient, what happens on the horizon, and there is also a modification between the relation of the currents of the horizon and the currents on the boundary. Right? So um, it depends on the details of how I'm play, playing this game. I'm basically uh, integrating a closed two-form, uh, a co-closed two-form in the bulk, and what happens when I do this integration to relate the currents on the horizon on the boundary is that I'm picking, some, picking up some extra terms from the bulk which have to do with the magnetization of, of the theory. Uh, now, this, this might look like um, it is spoiling, spoiling the whole game, but in fact, such terms and the discussion on magne background magnetization currents has appeared in, in condensed matter physics before us. And what condensed matter physicists are saying uh, it has to do with uh, a little bit of ambiguity of what is the transport current and what is the, the expectation value of your operator. And the result from, from uh, being careful with what is the transport current is basically telling you just to drop these magnetization terms. And what happens is that uh, the, the final statement is that the horizon is really picking precisely the transport currents, exactly what you are interested in. And you can also think of higher derivative gravity. You can include, for example, gauss bonnet terms. Um, the whole story goes through. Um, again, um, the statement that the horizons on the boundary are equal to the, um, uh, the fluxes on the, on, the, on the horizon only relies on deformorphism in variance, basically engaged transformations. And all that happens with higher derivative gravity is that you get extra higher derivative terms in your Stokes flow equations. Okay, so as soon as we have such a result, we would like to make contact, of course, um, with the well-established uh, results that you can get from the memory matrix formalism. And as I told you, if I have weak momentum relaxation, then there is a certain relation that you should be able to write down between kappa bar and sigma. And to achieve that, you basically think of a horizon which has very tiny, small ripples. And in that case, um, this system of uh, PDEs on the horizon becomes more tractable. And L here is a small parameter that has to do with uh, the height of these small ripples. And you can actually show um, that all transport coefficients are, as you would expect, dominated by the same big number with weak momentum relaxation. And the ratio of kappa bar and sigma is exactly what you would like it to be. Now, this is certainly uh, very, very, a very beautiful result from holography, but um, is it useful? Um, so what you can actually show uh, is certain bounds um, on the transport coefficients in terms of the horizon data. Okay? Um, in general, you don't know how to solve these linear PDEs on the horizon. But what you can do is you can bound the answer for the conductivity coefficients in terms of your horizon data. Now, the horizon data really depend on the UV data of uh, the theory. So 
it, it's not something um, completely arbitrary. It is fixed exactly by the deformations, the chemical potential, the temperature, the lattice strengths, all the deformations of your uh, background theory. And when these bounds become very, very powerful is the case of Einstein-Maxwell in D equals 4, where it simply tells you that sigma dc, or the dc limit of the electric conductivity, is bounded from below from the gauge, bulk, uh, from the gauge coupling in the bulk. And this is a very astonishing result if you think about it. No matter what shape of lattice uh, deformations I choose on the boundary, the conductivity will never drop below this uh, finite number. And the reason for this uh, finite number is that even if you try to break uh, translations strongly on the boundary, there is always this incoherent ha current happening uh, in your system which will always give you a current flow. Okay? And this is a very, very beautiful uh, result from holography. You can uh, also look at bounds that bound the open circuit uh, thermal conductivity. And in this case, if you have an Einstein-Maxwell uh, scalar theory in four dimensions with a potential that has a global minimum, you can uh, equally well show that uh, the open circuit thermal conductivity does not drop below a certain limit. Now, remember that kappa knows about this incoherent current, right? So you might think that if I bound sigma, which knows about it, I should also be able to bound kappa. And this is exactly what's, what's happening here. Now, you might also want to think about other things which I have not discussed. So, for these black holes where translations are broken uh, very badly, um, and you look at long wavelength excitations, um, then you should be able to find some diffusive modes or hydrodynamic modes of, of these black holes. This is, this is what's happening when all your conductivities in your system uh, become finite. So, the um, the sound modes that you usually have in uh, fluid gravity are now replaced by diffusive modes. What I have also not treated is the presence of supercurrents. So if I have a holographic superconductor, I'm going to have supercurrents uh, on the background and not on the background, but the supercurrents are definitely going to couple with my uh, conductivity perturbation. And I do need to treat supercurrents in a very, very nice way. But I do think that new physics has to be, new intuition from, from the physics side of the problem has to be involved in order to do that. And you might also want to think about finite but, but small frequencies. I'm still in the DC uh, limit of, uh, of my sources. And there, there could be, you could imagine a way that you can include now finite but small frequencies into the problem. And you might also wonder uh, what else does the horizon fix for you. Now, I mentioned uh, derivative expansion, and when you, look at hydro uh, when you look at holographic lattices, a derivative expansion is certainly possible. All you have to do is to take the period of your lattice and make it huge. Just make it big. And um, what, you can, what you can actually get out of it is you can utilize all those results that we have from, from fluid gravity, and you can now answer uh, the question of DC conductivity and AC conductivity from, from that perspective. Now, to recover these current fluxes that I have from the horizon, which are supposed to be exact, what you would have to do in that framework is to take an infinite expansion, right, an infinite derivative expansion, really solve for the fluxes in this infinite derivative expansion, integrate them, right, find the total flux of, of your currents, and then what should agree is the numbers, right? So, the fluxes that, uh, or the DC co coefficients that I extracted from the horizon should agree with, um, with the, the DC conductivities that I will extract from hydrodynamics after summing the full derivative uh, expansion. Now, such an expansion has been carried out in, uh, in the literature, and you can, you can do it either by examining uh, directly the conductivities or by systematically performing the hydrodynamic expansion. And this is certainly making uh, contact. It has also clarified um, a little bit of confusion that appeared in the literature. And it certainly clarifies the, 
the connection between sigma q that I stated in the beginning, and you can think of it as a hydrodynamic coefficient, with this DC formula that you can extract from, uh, from the horizon. Now, for the, for the rest of my talk, I want to become slightly more ambitious. Right? So, and I'm going to, uh, to look at specific models uh, which let you introduce uh, lattice, uh, uh, lattice deformations in a very, very efficient way. Now, what, they, what these models utilize is the existence of a global U1 symmetry or a global shift symmetry in the bulk. And what this symmetry allows you to do, so um, it allows you to basically break translations in the matter sector, but still keep the metric of, of the bulk uh, geometry homogeneous. So the metric or the stress tensor or the bulk stress tensor is invariant under these symmetries, and this immediately allows you to write, uh, to write down homogeneous metrics, um, which basically don't break translations, but the translations are broken from, from the matter sector. Now, in this model uh, that I wrote down for illustration, you can think of restoring translations either, either by taking this capital phi to zero or by taking k to infinity. You can think of k as a period in your system, and this, if I take k to zero, this is essentially the hydrodynamic limit of, of your lattice. Now, in this case, the Stokes flow equations become almost trivial, right? There is no PDEs. Um, they become algebraic equations we can simply solve, and you can extract the, the DC uh, conductivities from the horizon. But what has historically happened is that people were actually fiddling with, with the ODEs for the perturbation in the bulk. So if you, if you do that, you can actually construct quantities um, that are constant on the horizon, they do not renormalize as you go all the way to the boundary, and they give you precisely the currents in terms of horizon data. So if I write the, the explicit formula for the transport coefficients, then they are all expressed in terms of horizon data, right? So this phi h is the value of this uh, scalar that I had in my action exactly on the horizon. Rho is the charge density of the system, and S is the entropy density of the system. Now, what you can also do is you can introduce a magnetic field, right? And you can calculate this whole angle that I, that I mentioned before. Now, the motivation to do that is precisely because in cuprates, or in the strange metallic phase of the cuprates, the whole angle actually scales differently from the DC conductivity. And the fact that the DC conductivity and the whole angle are, are locked together is not only a consequence of slow momentum relaxation, as I told you before. The same is true for the Fermi liquids. And you might wonder if holography allows you to get away from this locking between the whole angle and the DC conductivity. Um, you can write down similar expressions in spirit for the whole angle and after you, for, for the conductivity. Uh, coefficients after you introduce a magnetic field, which are uh, pretty, pretty ugly. But what you're interested in really is a small b. Right? So these experiments are carried out with small magnetic fields. Now, if I take this small b limit of my formulae, what I discover is that sigma dc, or the dc limit of the electric conductivity, um, is, as I showed you before, written in terms of two terms, but actually the whole angle only cares about the second term. Okay, so um, you can think of these two terms as describing different, different physics. So the first term, you might think of it as encoding all the charge conjugation symmetric processes, and that the second term has to do with the net charge of the system, which is affected uh, by the presence of the magnetic field. And what holography allows you to do is to really have solutions, as, as I will show you uh, in a while, where the first term is actually dominant over the second term in the DC conductivity, and moreover, they scale differently with, with temperature, right? So as soon as you relax uh, the weak momentum relaxation uh, assumption, 
you, you see this whole new freedom that your system has and which holography um, summarizes very efficiently. Now, what about ground states? I, I told you about incoherent ground states, um, which are ground states that have to break translations. So let me write down one. There is many more. There is more examples in the literature, but I will just use uh, one to show you um, precisely how it has worked so far. So it has to do with the form that is capital Phi and Z and V that appear in my Lagrangian uh, can take. So if I think of configurations where this uh, scalar Phi is taking really large values, and in those regimes, um, the, the three functions are, are approximated by exponentials, then wh what, I can, what I can write down is a, a zero temperature uh, horizon solution, which, which looks very, very similar to the hyperscale uh, violating solutions which don't break, don't break translations. But of course, there is now these linear actions which are running on the background uh, of the system. And these ground states now actually break translations. Okay, so it's not, it's not really the same physics with the hyperscale, hyperscale violating solutions. And it really allows me to probe uh, physics um, when translations are broken very strongly. Um, such examples can be found top down. They can be found in type 2B if you, if you use the action dilaton uh, sector. These are, of course, or lar large n expansions or large n uh, constructions. You can also find them in uh, four dimensional, uh, in maximal four dimensional supergravity. And the results that I am going to discuss now also apply for those cases. Okay, so these are really results that you can find top down. Um, so, what you find for these geometries. Okay, so you have this cold black hole horizon um, or zero temperature uh, black hole. Um, you can actually introduce a small temperature and you can study exactly what the horizon wants to do at small temperatures. Right? So I can just now go back to my formula for the DC conductivity and plug in uh, the behavior for a small black hole horizon. And what you discover is that uh, the heat and the electric current now scale completely independently. There is, a, the, there is a violation of any possible bound that you can uh, try to write down. So the systems remain, this system remains metallic. It conducts electricity, it conducts heat. But as you lower the temperature, these are getting parametrically smaller and smaller. And this is telling you that there is no, uh, there is no bound you can actually write for these systems. Now the whole angle and the electric conductivity that I told you before scale differently. And there has been also some, some efforts to actually get the scaling that you find in the cuprates. So sigma in the cuprate scales like t to the minus 1, and the whole angle scales like t to the minus 2. Now, I can keep track of these poles that I told you before, right? That have to do with momentum relaxation. And there was a very nice paper that actually did this, and this was done for... Uh, a relatively simple system, but it really tells you exactly what's going on. So for a small parameter k on t, where momentum relaxation um, is very weak, you can actually find this privileged pole, which is very close to the, to the origin of the complex plane, of the complex omega plane. And as you keep increasing k and you break translations more and more badly, this pole moves down and it joins another pole which has to do with more microscopic structure of your theory and they move uh, off the imaginary axis. And this is telling you that um, at this stage you have reached now an incoherent transport regime. Now, as I told you before, uh, what characterizes uh, such materials where uh, translations are broken very badly is the fact that they are become diffusive. So the energy density and the charge density uh, are now becoming diffusive. Uh, the long wavelength excitations of these uh, charges become uh, diffusive. And 
the good thing in discussing diffusion is that you can start thinking in terms of the microscopic description of your theory. For example, you can think of uh, the Fermi liquid, and diffusion is really fixed by the Fermi velocity that you can extract from the Fermi surface, and the mean free path that you have in your system. And this lets you extract a characteristic time scale, which actually fixes diffusion for those systems. Now, there has been experiments which try to um, estimate the time scales involved, for example, in cuprates, which are incoherent uh, materials, and they have shown some extremely small time scales. These time scales actually saturate the proposed bounds of the smallest possible time scale that you can have for thermalization in a quantum system. Now, there has been a proposal by uh, Sean that the diffusion constants should be bounded from below. So there has to be some uh, characteristic velocity that you can probably define in these systems and a time scale and diffusion cannot be smaller than, uh, than v squared times tau. Now, if I, if I study uh, these modes from a hydrodynamics point of view, I can really relate the corresponding diffusion constants to transport coefficients and thermodynamic susceptibilities. Right? So um, this is really telling me exactly how to use all these techniques that we have uh, in holography. So the transport coefficients now are very easy to extract from the black hole horizons, and equally well uh, you can extract um, thermodynamic susceptibilities from the black hole geometries. And you can actually start testing uh, these ideas of having lower bounds for the diffusion constants. So this is one question that has been already asked. And there seems to be a very, very surprising answer. So for all these uh, geometries uh, that have to do with Q lattices, it is relatively, uh, I don't want to say straightforward, but it is now a more standard procedure to read of the butterfly velocity, right? So all you have to do is to study uh, a shock wave falling through these geometries. And because the ho horizon does not break translations or it is just homogeneous, you can come up with a very, very well-defined answer for the butterfly velocity. You can make sense of a butterfly velocity. Um, okay. Now, what happens for all these Q lattice ground states uh, that I have uh, described is that these diffusion constants actually simplify a lot. They simplify dramatically. If I pick one of them, which uh, I'm calling D minus, it is simply the ratio between kappa, which I described before, divided by the um, specific heat at uh, fixed charge density. And so just by inspection, you can estimate by looking at black hole horizons what happens to this uh, diffusion constant. And you can also estimate by looking at uh, the black hole horizon data at what happens with, um, uh, with the butterfly velocity. And what has actually been found is that there is always a relation between the diffusion constants and the butterfly velocity and the temperature. And this number E here is, uh, is a dimensionless number, and it has been found to be always greater than one half. Okay, so there is this very, very non-trivial relation uh, between the diffusion constants and the butterfly velocity and the temperature. Now, if you ask me, um, or I guess if you ask anyone, this is completely unexpected. I mean, these two quantities should have nothing to do with each other. They are completely different calculations. One way of, of reading uh, this uh, this equation is by saying that there is some scales in your system which fix the butterfly velocity. And the same scales are actually responsible for fixing the diffusion constants. And this is already a pretty non-trivial uh, statement that has come out of holography. Again, it has to do with these very fine-tuned models, which are the Q lattices. But this really makes you think um, whether this is possible in non-holographic systems. So this very surprising um, um, 
relation between diffusion and, and chaos um, was very tempting to many groups of people who are studying systems which probably have nothing to do with Einstein gravity, and they did similar calculations. They, calculate, they calculated the diffusion constants, they calculated uh, the butterfly velocity in their systems. These were chaotic systems, so they could define really uh, a butterfly velocity, and they started reproducing the same type of relations. Right? So um, there is again some relation between d and v squared times 1 over t with a different coefficient in epsilon, in e. This e is always a different coefficient. And the question is, I guess one of the questions is, what is the lower bound for e in any theory? So if there is such a lower bound, and if we can uh, make sense in the end of this uh, very nice relation, it comes out, and then this is a pretty non-trivial statement about time scales um, in, in the system. What is fixed by what? Um, I need to mention that I had this 1 over t, vb squared time, times 1 over t. Um, but for systems uh, for which the Lyapunov exponent is not simply fixed by 1 over t, and you find some different power, right? so 1 over t is like, uh, is like a bound for the, for the Lyapunov exponent that you can have. What has been found to actually work better is to multiply uh, the butterfly velocity times the inverse of the Lyapunov exponent. Right, so um, this is now becoming to, to look even more interesting. So let me conclude. So I discussed transport and momentum relaxation in holography. I also um, showed you that uh, DC conductivities in holography are fixed only by looking at the black hole horizon, and this is a very beautiful result. I have also discussed holographic ground states, which uh, um, describe incoherent transport, or states, ground states which break translations very badly. There is also this hint of universality that can come out of holography for incoherent transport, this story with uh, the butterfly velocity. And there is a vast variety of ground states out there waiting to be, to be tested and to, to extract uh, information from, which have shown up um, in uh, holographic studies of the phase diagrams of strongly coupled matter. And I, I certainly believe that in the, in the near, near future, they are going to provide new non-trivial information about uh, transport. So, thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for this very nice overview thank and for the advertising. <laughs> so, I'm sure there are many questions. Well, at least I have one. Oh, there's one there. Veronica. Yeah. Between um, the diffusion and the butterfly velocity, where this coefficient e was bounded from mm -hmm. uh, below by half, is there any? I mean, is there any upper bound, or what's the uh, spectrum of the different values for E for the um, Actually, no, there, there, there is no upper bound. So if, if the, those ground states that you are looking at are really getting close to being a Poincaré invariant, then this actually blows up. Um, but there is a number relating VB squared times, uh, times T to the diffusion constant. But as you, as you do approach the, the Poincaré invariant case, you, you basically start uh, getting a big number. So the question is more about the, a lower bound, not, not an upper bound. Is it possible to have gapped strange metals? Say that again? Gapped strange metals. Is it possible to have them? Um, I certainly believe that this would be nice, uh, but all these results that we, we have now, that, and the way we understand transport from black hole horizons, is telling you that you have to really start, uh, stop thinking about black hole horizons. So th there has to be other geometries which don't have 
uh, smooth uh, black hole type of horizons to actually get, uh, you are imagining, I'm, I'm guessing, exactly zero conductivity, right? Or, or exactly zero thermal conductivity. Yes. Um, so what you can show from, from these Stokes flow equations is that there is always uh, a little bit of conductivity happening. It, so the conductivity coefficients are uh, positive numbers. So again, about the um, lower bound E larger than one half, what, what, what is the class of theory that saturates the bound? Um, what is the classical field that saturates the bound? What is, the, is there any common, is there anything common between the theories that saturate the bound? Um, I want to say large n, but there is also examples of theories where n was finite. And they all have to do with incoherent transport, really. Um, so it was, um, um, except for one example, I think. Um, so it, it, there were examples that momentum was relaxing strongly. Chris? Um. So there were these uh, proposed violations of the viscosity bound that involved alpha prime corrections mm -hmm. and one over n corrections and yes. in holographic models. Yes. W what happens to these violations if you rephrase it in terms of the butterfly velocity and Lyapunov exponent? Excellent question. This is definitely something to, exam to, to examine in the, in the near future, right? So um, this proposal is certainly new, and there is a lot of room. Uh, that for, for, for checking, even within holography. I mean, people are attacking the problem from, from the field theory point of view by using quantum mechanical models, but even within holography, you can, you can start asking what is happening with alpha primed uh, corrections or high derivative corrections uh, in the theory. So yeah, um, this is definitely a good direction to start investigating. Any further question? Um, let me ask one more thing. Um, so you emphasize very much that it's very important. Uh, so holography provides these uh, important examples of uh, universal quantities. Mm -hmm. And um, so do, do you think there's a prospect for finding more of these? And can you actually verify them experimentally? Um, um, it's, well, I, I cannot say something uh, mm -hmm. too specific now, um, but um, yeah, even, even for this case, it would be nice to actually have experiments and quantify what this VB is. Right, so um, it's not entirely clear that this is something yet that you can actually measure experimentally. It's, it's more of a fundamental importance at this stage. Okay. Okay, so if there are no more further questions. Oh, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I have one question, it's probably too elementary, about the Q lattices. Yes. So you mentioned they break translation symmetry, mm -hmm. but they preserve a combination of translation and shift of the axion at the level of your, you are working on. Uh, it seems that the, shi the axion shift symmetry is a symmetry of the gravity solution. That's, so that's is, is that an issue of the boundary conditions or why? Uh, um, right. it, it all has to do with the asymptotic boundary. Um, so um, you, can, you can probably try and undo um, this uh, deformation on the boundary, but, but um, you are basically constrained by the boundary conditions. You cannot, you cannot simply just undo it. Okay, anything else? Okay, if not, so let's thank us again. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.